Blast off on another episode of Hero Paranormal Podcast. That's right. My name is Ryan, the original outlaw of the airwaves, bringing you another VIP episode. Just south of Area 51 at the base of La Madre Mountain is where we're bringing it from. And I'll tell you what, the guest today is somebody who I have wanted to have on for over a year. He is somebody in the know who seems to know mostly about everything. And not only that, he's a super nice guy. I'm just going to call him T for now. If we're able to share his name during the podcast, I definitely will. I know that he has some important clearances that he may or may not be able to break. So we're going to keep it real and respect anything that he can't talk about. With that being said, I'm going to try to take it there wherever and everywhere, anywhere that he has any information, I'm going to try to itch and scratch and try to figure out what he does know because he is such a fascinating individual with such a breadth of knowledge about everything high strange and paranormal and uh, does a lot of contract work as well for the U.S. government. So um, I want to thank him for his service. Uh, Speaking of thanking people, thank you to the patrons who have gone over to HeroParanormal.com and smashed that subscribe button. Uh, If you go ahead and donate there, you are in the know, in the inner circle, and you get everything Hero Paranormal has to offer. We're also available uh, here. You can go to Hero Paranormal on Patreon. So thanks for the new listeners over there. It's tough to do this stuff, you know, with kids and and. It, you know, you guys all know how it is, S- scraping away a little time to do your passions. Well, this is what it is, and I appreciate those who helped me do it. So without further ado, T, welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast, my man. How you been? It's been a long time. It has. It's been a really long time. <laughs> so how are you? You know, I can't complain. Life is good, given the fact of every the, all the weirdness that has taken place since, since we saw each other last. My gosh, the world has been flipped on its head. Oh, I know. It's just insanity. And then, you know, I uh, after I uh, was down in um, in Roosevelt with you the last time, you know, I went to work for the back to work for the government. So, oh, that's cool. I that's what I heard that you went to Nevada. I think it was Nevada. I couldn't. I can't remember. You don't have to say. And I want to ask yeah. you too. How do you want me to? Um, uh, you want me to call you just Terrence or just Mr. T or how how would you like me to call you? Call me yeah, call me Terrence. Okay, yeah, great. At, at my age, I don't give I don't care anymore what you know about anything. So you've been you've been in the game a long time, and I have man so many questions to ask you. And yeah, last time we saw each other was in the Uinta Basin, and we did encounter I guess some high strangeness. Do you want to talk about that? Well, if you're talking about the uh, incident where I, uh, when we went to the uh, elders' place, and uh, mm-hmm. I got kind of got pushed down, I guess you would call it, mm-hmm. you know, because I was probably taking photos of something I shouldn't have been. Anyway. <laughs> that uh, was a wild experience. It, you, I mean, I could feel, even though I wasn't, push down or thrown or anything. I could feel the energy in that, that area. It's just so wild up there in the Uinta Basin. The energy was amazing. And, and, you know, it, was, it just blew me away. And it, it kind of followed me for a little bit after that, you know, and, and mm. um, yeah, it was definitely high strangeness, but that area, you know, I've been going down there since been going over there since 1990. And, the things that have happened there that just blow me away, you know. Um, I think the most incredible one was my friend Dan Merkley, mm-hmm. who passed away a year ago last Christmas Eve. God uh, bless him. Yep, remember him well. He and I twice 
was uh, a really strange craft. Because he was a non-believer. He just figured it was something different, you know. Mm-hmm. And when we would watch the lights and do different things, because we used to go out there every couple of weeks and stay for a week. He had a house in Roosevelt. And um, it uh, was set vacant, but we would take a trailer and go out and sit out there and go exploring and do different things, go around Skinwalker. Um, but twice we saw, just after that uh, encounter at your place, um, we saw <laughs> we saw this strange, I guess you would call it a craft, it was basically lights. But what was strange about it, it had a couple of green lights, two bright lights on the top, and one extremely bright red light in a red color that you've never seen before. It just was intense. When you tried to look at it and focus on it, it was like somebody was shaking your head, vibrating your head. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't focus on the craft. And the second time we saw it was probably a good four four minutes. And... uh, that was just south of uh, Roosevelt, and we were probably a quarter mile away of that, and uh, I've never seen anything like it before or since, but uh, it was pretty interesting that when you looked at it, it just, you know, it was like your eyes started vibrating in your head, like somebody was shaking your head extremely quick. Right, right. And... Um, so definitely, was, that's probably the most, the strangest encounter I've ever had down there. All the other things pale in comparison. You know, those, that one. those green and red lights, they have been witnessed right around the Fort Duchesne Reservation. Actually, right. you know, and, and by many people, this is uh, red and blue or red and green, however you want to... You know, it's it's really like you said though. They kind of it's like a hologram almost the way they can fade out. It sounds like. Yeah, and it did. It just it, when it was there for a while, and then it just poof, it was gone. And at first, the first time we saw it, Dan thought it was a helicopter because the helicopter sometimes would fly over to the medical center in Roosevelt, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and being around helicopters <laughs> forever, you know, it definitely wasn't a helicopter because it was a hum. There was no noise, and we were close enough. If it was a, if it was a helicopter, you definitely would hear it. You know, even the military helicopters that are stealth that don't have much noise behind them because they use those special blades, which I've had experience with. Uh, you can still hear them because they make a whooshing sound. But this was just a constant hum and a, and a vibration. It was, I, 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 it's just difficult to explain. So cool, but, though. Uh, and But you're not, you, you know, the nice thing is you're not the only one, and that's what's neat about yeah. that. It's, it's, it's really cool. Well, I remember going to, we went to uh, Marion's and Roosevelt, if you know where that is, for breakfast one morning after that mm-hmm. and I and we were sitting at the counter and I was talking with my friend Dan about it and some other people came in and overheard heard us talking and they said that they saw the same thing so it was uh, not an isolated experience I wanted to ask you since you kind of mentioned it's not an isolated experience there's other areas too and I want to get into the felt blades that you mentioned too, before I forget, but, um, there's other areas where they feel this stuff too. And they usually think there's portals and stuff like that. Have you had any experience in any, any like other areas where you've had, you know, where this type of stuff is seemed, you know, to takes place? Well, you can see, you can experience that anywhere in the basin, as you well know. I mean, anywhere along the Ridge Mm -hmm. in Walker Ridge, you know, it's isolated, you know, there's an isolated point at Skinwalker, but that entire area is, my main experiences that I've had, I haven't been around the ranch as much as it's been 
just in different areas. Um, so you see them all over. The, the most experiences I've had with things like that, though, has been in the West Utah Desert if that's what you're referring to. so It kind of was. After, yeah, that's kind of where I was going with that. You, you kind of saw. Since I lived there, lived <laughs> right next to the UTTR and Dugway for 35 years and uh, contracted with a couple of uh, companies that did communications out there. Um, yeah, I've had some really strange experiences out there, even crazier than the crap that Dan and I saw. Um, and my wife was with me on two occasions mm-hmm. where we had experiences with orbs. Um, and, of course, you've got a picture of, of what appears to be an orb <laughs> in the back of your place. Right, right. Yeah, something like that. Um, but uh yeah there's uh there's definitely high strangeness out there I'll tell you you know you I've I've seen um running the craft on the ground being out on the range when they shouldn't have been mhm and uh if you've ever been out there there's these mounds you know there's just the standard thing that you're running to in the desert and well, I'll go back to the very first one that really got to me, and it was part of a thing called Project Bluebeam that the uh, University of Utah was working out, working on out on the range, and uh, we were just out cruising around, me and a, a friend of mine, and in the one section out there on the on the range. You uh, went around the corner because we could see a glow behind one of the one of the hills. Went around the corner and there was all these guys out there with equipment and setting things up. But there was also a craft off in the distance, part of Plot Project Bluebeam. But it was just a glowing, fiery orange, kind of saucer shape, but round on the edges and just kind of a. It was pretty strange, and you could feel it. You could feel the energy from it, and I was probably a half a mile away. Wow. But uh, if you've spent any time at all out there, you definitely run into things off and on. I used to uh, go into Salt Lake and work with a model railroad club on weekends. And coming back, and come back really late at night, I'd leave it. 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and drive back to Wendover. And I would get this urge to stop at the Eagle Range exit, which is actually called Grassy Knolls by the State Highway Department. But uh, a couple of times there, I would stop, pull off, go on a dirt road just to take a little break and get out and look at the stars to do that. I like to do that often. Love that. And you would feel all of the hair on your arms would start, your hair and everything would start to stand up. And the whole, all the mountains around you would light up. You couldn't see anything, but you could feel it. The energy would just vibrate through your body Mm -hmm. as if something was there. And the, the light would be kind of a, like a moonlight, but there's no moon in the sky, and it would just kind of, things would light up, and and the way you'd go. And you, you, it was enough to kind of instill a little bit of fear in you, so I used to just be worried that I was going to be abducted or something, and we'd just get in my car and get back out of it. And it's so desolate out there. Like you said, it, it doesn't take... Oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the old days, you know, they used to have... Uh, Air Force used to go up and down I-15 with their lights flashing to make sure nobody got off off the exits mm-hmm. at Knolls and Ragonite and, and uh, different areas out there just above Dugway. 
and they would block off the exits and the on-ramps and guard the area whenever they were doing something out there. And you would see things like like a blue laser light that would just shoot up straight up through clouds, things like that. You'd see stuff like that all the time. Wow. But, uh, and most people, they just, they don't pay attention to things, so they never see that. And when you tell people, well, did you see that the other night? They just think you're nuts, but... Right. I've just always been observant, so... But um, the strangest thing I think I ran into out on the West Desert, and I kind of tie it to uh, a little-known project in the 70s called the Tesla Project that they did in the Enola Gay Hangar out there with Dr. Robert Goka. When, and the official thing that they say, and it was a right path, that Patterson Air Force Base uh, sponsored project through their uh, Foreign Technologies Division. And I used to go down and <clears throat> help him out a little bit. That was the first time I'd gone to that area. And he was working on a plasma project, not, not the ball lightning that, that's officially listed as what, what the Tesla project was about. And... Um, Years later, this goes back to 2013, my wife and I, we used to go out, drive out on Old Highway 4 to go across the tracks and go out on the range because on nice days, it'd be just a nice little walk out there. Uh, one time we were out there, the first time, my wife, I was paying attention to something else, and my wife says, what the heck is this? I turn around and here come two plasma this orbs. I call them plasma balls. Everybody else calls them orbs, but um, they come streaming across the desert about six, eight feet off the ground towards us. When we first, she first spotted them, and they were quite a distance away. They came up to about ten feet in front of us. Two of them. Mm-hmm. They're larger than a about double the size of a basketball. And they, you, when you look at it, it's a purplish, it's plasma. If you've ever seen uh, plasma generated in a vacuum, that's what they look like. Wow, man. And um, anyway, the day we were out there that time, it was lunchtime. Uh, my wife, she was just in awe. She was just going, what the, What are these? What are these? And I, I didn't say anything, but they just sat there. And the next thing I remember is they shot up about 20 feet in the air and then took off to the south. They came from the east when they approached us. And what I remember most is on the drive home, we had gone out there at lunchtime, and on the drive home, the sun was going down. So there was a period of the lapse time that went from about one o'clock in the afternoon, and this was Whoa. summertime. So the sun went down at about nine o'clock at night. Whoa! And uh, driving home, my wife was in a daze, and I kept asking her what how she felt. She didn't respond to me at all. And when we got home, you know, I started talking to her about it. She couldn't remember Happens. The, the two orbs approaching us at all. She didn't remember it. She mm -hmm. just thought that we'd just dri driven out there and she didn't even know we got out of the car. Mm -hmm. But I distinctly remember that the two, the, them approaching us, being in front of us, and going up into the air and taking off at a high rate of speed to the south. And it dawned on me later that, hey, you know, there's a lapse of time from when we went out there at lunchtime to when we got home. It had to have been about four or five, six hours. Holy that, cow. Between the time that I remember seeing those two orbs in front of us and then the orbs going up and then shooting off to the south and then driving home, the sun was just above the mountains to the west. Mm -hmm. So we definitely lost some time. And the second time that that happened to us, 
it was about the same location, and um, it was a similar experience. <laughs> I'm giving away a little, getting in trouble for trespassing, but I was actually on the railroad tracks. Okay. And yeah. I'd, climbed, I'd climbed up to the top of the uh, uh, signal tower um, for the railroad, the railroad signal. Mm-hmm. And was coming down, and my wife again, she said, look. <laughs> she was yelling at me, and I went over to where she was out on the desert there about just 100 yards from the railroad tracks. And she had spotted them way off, and they were two small little dots at that time, and they came up to us again. And it was this almost the same experience all over again. Only that time it wasn't, it was only a couple of hours, probably. And but the same thing happened to her when we got home. She could she could remember the orbs coming up to her, but she couldn't remember anything past that. She yep. couldn't remember getting in the car and driving home. Man, and, uh, wild plasma projects, foreign technology division, Tesla project. This is wild. And then when you said Knowles and Aragonite, I always say that wrong. Aragonite. That that area is wild. Oh yeah, there's a lot of things. That, if you know any of the people that have ever worked out there when they put those facilities in, it's it's kind of a strange thing. And and the guy who started it all was a guy named Semenani, who built it for um, for uh, toxic waste dump, and then uh, Union Pacific Corp built a burn plant there that never really was a burn plant mm-hmm. at, at uh, just uh, east of Knowles there. But it's also the it's also the northern gateway into Dugway. So if you go out there, you're usually met with uh, security people and they won't let you drive any further out on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like Area 51. If you ever been to that gate there's always somebody shows up and turns you away you're so right about and, that uh, gosh it's like in immediate force but uh it's been when they first started building that facility uh, we used to drive out there because there's a couple of dirt roads the, the security used to be pretty lax out there and you could drive around on the range and not get in trouble in fact i used to go out there and get you know, old military artifacts and everything from from tests. You know, you'd find them laying on the ground, and I'd collect them and drag them home. <laughs> Even got a test bomb for the Enola Gay at one time, and we drug it into Wendover. And I had uh, Fort Douglas on my back over that one. They thought it was a live ordinance, but uh, that's another story for another time. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, if you don't mind me going back, I wanted to get back to that cool laser that you said people see going up and down. I just had to mention this. You probably know Dave Rosenfeld or some some of our listeners might, but he got a picture of something similar to that. So, I mean, again, something that more than one person seen. Yeah, uh, you could see it from Wendover if you were... I used to go at nighttime watch the sunset. And a couple of hours later, you know, you would sit there and all of a sudden, bang, this thing would just shoot up through the clouds, and it was extremely bright. I, you know, I yeah, Just working around that technology with the Tesla project and a few other things, it definitely wasn't a laser. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really don't know what it is. I can only speculate. But, but uh, you used to see that on for a period of time, quite, you know, quite a bit, you so know, cool. where you just be sitting there and all of a sudden, bang, this thing would just shoot up off the desert floor. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I know who Dave is, but, you know, just by people telling me who he is, but I've never met him or talked to him or I really don't know much about what he does, but, 
Yeah, he's out there quite a bit. Well, you know, on the outsides, the outskirts, a lot of the areas you're yeah. mentioning, knolls. And I wanted to ask you about the round edges on like UFOs that you have seen. Do they ever look like, you know, like the Lazar UFO? Is that what kind of, or is it different? No, no. The, well, I've seen similar ones to the Lazar U, UFO. Mm-hmm. I mean, we used to go, when I lived in Vegas and worked down in Vegas, we used to go up before I even knew who Lazar was or knew what it was going on. They got tips from people. We would go up and sit on a certain ridge and you'd watch the lights. And, uh. Um, Love it. So you'd watch the crap go, and every once in a while you'd get one that would buzz you. And I figured those were just something that we were experimenting with, uh, our government. Mm-hmm. And uh, those were similar to the Lazar UFO. But the ones that I've seen out on the uh, West Desert, they were a bright orange. You couldn't define the edges. Uh, the bottom part would be kind of like a, a boomerang, the mm-hmm. rounded edges, mm-hmm. and with a little bubble on top of it, and you couldn't really tell what was going on with it because they were bright, bright orange. It was almost like they were on fire. And um, That's cool. Did see it long, when I first went out there, early 80s, and used to go out, there's an old railroad bed that would go out to Gold Hill, and it goes through the range. And every once in a while, you would see, off in the distance, you would see craft that were like that. That were, They were just lit up. You know, they were bright. They weren't, they didn't look metallic. Um, it's just difficult to explain. Similar to the plasma balls, only a lot larger. Yeah. And probably about 30, 40 feet in diameter. Wow. About 12 to 18 feet thick um, would be my estimate. But, uh, and then there was just a period of maybe a couple of years where I saw those and then you never, never saw them again. They just didn't ever see them again after that. But uh, the lights, you see lights all the time come up off the desert floor, scoot across the, and just disappear. So cool. Or they go at a high rate of speed, shoot off in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. Um, Completely different. And just a little antidote to that, we went, used to go shopping, when you live out in the middle of nowhere, you go shopping in Salt Lake or Idaho or other places and you usually go once a week. On the way back, we would always be late and always stop at the rest area at, uh, at Aragonite. And, um, there was a, about two, three, four year period where all the guys from a flight line at Hill Air Force Base would all be sitting up on their cars up on the hill in the parking lot drinking beer. And a couple of times I went up to ask them what was going on. And that's how I found out they were from Hill Air Force Base, Air Force guys off the flight line. They'd say, well, we're just coming to look at the fireworks and look at the lights because you had a good view out over the dugway range. Right. And these guys would come out there on, on Wednesday and Thursday nights and sit out at the rest area to watch what was going on out on the range. Man, and, good uh, view, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, a couple of times we sat, sat with them and waited for things to happen, and yeah, sure enough, you know, you would see lights come up off the desert floor. There's a, there's a mountain out there that has an air base behind it, um, just off Knowles, and... Um, you can see it on Google Earth. Well, you can see all kinds of things on Google Earth out there. A lot of them are blocked out, but um, that's the area where the lights would come from. And I know, knowing a couple of people that have worked out there, they said that the mountain, everything's inside the mountain. 
and uh, they have these big doors. Uh, at, later on, I think looking at some of the videos that uh, the Bob Lazar um, said, you know, that they had these big hangar doors that would just open up and look just like the mountain. Yep. And the guys that I talked to that worked out there on all these different projects, um, they explained that there were two sides, two areas in that mountain where the uh, mountain would just open up and then they would bring out the test test craft. Wow. And um, something so cool is, you know, this this idea of like hidden secret bases has been around a long time, you know, the the deep underground military bases. Yeah. At, well, if you know the history of that area, you know, it's pretty much one of the largest military installations mm-hmm. in the U.S., if not the, on the planet. So true. They've been, uh, and that was the first, it was part of the Manhattan Project, one, uh, Wendover Air, Air Base, Wendover wow. Field. It was part of the Manhattan Project, where they learned how to assemble the atom bomb and do all that. Those buildings, a few of those buildings still exist out there on that base and in Wendover. And um, there were 40,000 people there during World War II Man. on that base. And you got greeted on Highway 40 by a guard in a guard shack before you could enter town and before you could leave town. And if you know the history of that area, they started digging underground in 1939, and they haven't quit today, is my understanding, that they still expand and everything's underground out there on that, out there on that range. Um, I've, explored a little bit what other people say about it and I don't think very many people really can fathom what really is out there and what really goes on out there. If you, I used to have a pass to drive across the test range to go to a place called uh, Lakeside and um, I used to shoot rail photography, still do. And to get to the tracks where the uh, causeway comes across from Ogden, Utah, to uh, across the Great Salt Lake, there's a fill there there for the Transcontinental Railroad, and it intersects with that. In fact, um, there's a road that goes up to the towers, that, the radio towers, and all the communication towers for the test range to Hill, Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And you used to be able to drive up there and watch the uh, F-4s in the early days and then the F-16s fly in below you and then blast targets that were, that they would haul out on the desert. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's an interesting place <laughs> as far as that goes. But, um, yeah, they, there's, there's roads out there that are well maintained and really, you know, I would equate it to four lane highway. It just goes up to a mountain and stops. <laughs> and it's like you look at the road and you drive on the road, you go up to the mountain, the whole side of the mountain, all of the foliage, everything is one color. And it's usually kind of a bronze gold color. And it doesn't really fit with the terrain, but if you look at it from a distance, it just blends in. Mm. And you don't spend very much time out there trying to explore when you're out on that, that range because you look up into the distance and here comes everybody in the Humvees and military vehicles wanting to know what the heck you're doing, you know? Right. And, you know, well, you get stories like that in other places like the Dulce Base. And have you heard of yeah. any other locations where this type of thing happens or maybe Area 51? Well, Tonopah. Mm-hmm. You know, Tonopah test range, something that a lot of people don't know about. You know, that, I, that's actually, you know, they say that they did the F-117 at, and all these other aircraft at 
Area 51, but they actually stored them and flew them out of, out of Tonopah. Mm. Tonopah, what the government started doing back in the old days, when, on a couple of contracts I'd worked on, they started privatizing everything so you couldn't get any information on any of their projects through a FOIA. Um, most recent contract I worked on was a contract that used to be a Pentagon operation, but they privatized it. It was the OIT, the Office of Information and Technology. But they privatized it because you're, you're not susceptible to a FOIA act. So a lot, most of the military and military industrial complex is all privatized under that because then you got a private citizen or anyone else can't submit a FOIA request and get any information on any projects or any ongoing technology that they're working on. Genius. Um, the Tonopah test range, test base is owned by Lockheed, North of Grumman now, Lockheed and North of Grumman. And um, I've, <laughs> I've actually been arrested out there a couple of times. <laughs> oh, I'm doing a, I used to work for a late 70s, early 80s, worked on a project doing fiber optics. Before anybody knew what fiber optics was, it was funded by Lockheed and government and um, based out of Las Vegas. It was called EDT. It's like devolved that now electronic data technologies. And um, they were experimenting with all different kinds of fiber optics. And one of the things that we did was we did a test situation to test the communications, and we did one in a casino in Tonopah and one in a casino in Wendell, where we ran all fiber optics through the casino, and, and uh, this was early 80s. Cool. And uh, tied some systems together to monitor flop play. It was the beginning of the players' clubs that you see in casinos right now. Yeah. Those were the two, two first casinos in Nevada that that had the technology, and they didn't call them player clubs back then. We just used it to experiment. Um, and the engineers would come in off of the, uh, when I was doing the one casino in, Te in Tonopah, the engineers would come in off the, the base at night and stay at the casino we were working at. And they would tell us, hey, you want to see some strange things go on, you, you go up to this part on the highway, you'll see some poles going out. There's some rocks stacked up, take the dirt road, go out till you, come, till you come to a certain spot that's high up in the air, and you can overlook the range and watch what's going on. So one of the guys I was working with decided we would go out there one night. We were out there sitting on the tailgate of a, my El Camino I had at the time. And, and uh, we were sitting there having a couple of beers and watching. And pretty soon the fireworks started. And lights come roaring up off the desert floor. and we, we were in awe. And the next thing you know, we got two guys telling us, get on the ground, hands on our head on the ground. And they've got a, a, a M16s pointed at us. Oh, man. <laughs> and and uh, I spent uh, four days in uh, Eoch, Nevada, in, the, in a, basically a prison cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, my partner was intelligence for the Navy. They took him to a different location. I didn't find out what happened to him until a couple months later, and they just grilled him and let him go. Made him sign, sign, um, see, you know, paperwork saying that you didn't see anything, he wasn't there. I had to do the same. Mm -hmm. But um, I spent four days 
And uh, then when I came back, they moved my car to the hotel. And I had the sheriff waiting for me, and he escorted me out of town. I called called the company, and I said, okay, what's going on? And they said, well, you're off the job. We're trans- We're going to put you someplace else. Obviously, you saw something you weren't supposed to see. Oh. <laughs> and um, that was a pretty strange experience. It, I had... They, Went in, packed all my bags, everything I had to pull. Just went into my room with two escorts, pulled everything out, put it in my car, and the sheriff followed me out of town to make sure that I was outside of Tonopah and headed out, out of town. So that's how they do things. And then you sign a, you sign your oath that you didn't see anything, didn't do anything. Um, don't know anything about what's going on, and if you ever tell anybody that you'll do 20, 20 years in prison, you know. Jeez. You know, yeah, I I recently drove from Vegas up to Lake Tahoe, and I'll tell you what, you kind of drive through a lot of that territory that you're talking about, and you really yeah, drive right past it on ninety five. Yeah, it's I, I, you can't. I mean, the size of it is impossible to even describe and it, i mean you have all kinds of like you said private contractors nav c uh you see all the contractors really cool stuff along the road and, mm-hmm. and you get to it's just amazing to see all all those tax dollars at work it's just fascinating yeah well there's a, you know there's a corridor that runs from edwards down the fire 51 and up through to UTTR Dugway. So, and it's, it's, you know, there's no population there. You know, these guys can fly out of Skunk Works or Edwards or 41, one of those, and just go on a flight, go straight up to UTTR, which is the largest test range. You know, they just expanded another 235,000 acres out there to uh, expand their supersonic corridor. And um, and so I, that goes on all the time. You know, and most of the time, the only people that see it are the ranchers that are out there in the middle of nowhere, and those, they don't care. Mm-mm. You know, they're not going to, they just see it and just figure, well, what the heck. Right. I mean, but, uh, it, it doesn't bother them. No, it doesn't bother them. You know, the only people that I've discovered, and just recently just getting into the this UFO thing, community and paranormal community, uh, they're the only people that really care about what's, what they see or want to say anything about it everybody else just sees things and you know it just goes by them you know mm-hmm. yeah. so that's why you don't I, I think that's why you don't hear a lot about what really goes on in a lot of different parts of the country but, but uh, and i think there's a good know, point they, if there's less residents you can get a lot you can get a lot more done yeah and uh, well most of the time people don't even they aren't even aware of what's going on above them. You know, you're there in their houses and doing whatever, and you've only got you've got Highway 93, Highway 95, and a couple of smaller roads where the local people take. You know, when they're traveling around mm-hmm. up north of Austin, Eureka, and those areas. And so, if you're be up north of those on Highway 50 and in that corridor, you know, you might, a plane could fly over you at 50 feet and you probably would never know it. Exactly. It's just the way the landscape is set up. It's really hard to see things. And, you know, you hear a lot of stories about Area 51 projects and I, I was fascinated by the fiber optic project you mentioned. Did you ever come across or hear about anything about 5G or do you have any opinions of that? That's a, that's a tough one. Well, my friend just died from it, so 
him and 30 of people that he worked with Jeez. on a government contract. So I think that's uh, my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's up in the same range as microwave oven. You know, in fact, it's a little higher. So if you're very close to it or close to a tower, you know, over time you're going to get cancer and die. Uh, my friend Dan, that uh, he's a fellow electronics guy, engineer. We've known, we knew each other for 50 years mm -hmm. before he passed away. He worked on a project with a government contract working on 5G technology. And every one of them developed a rare form of bone and blood cancer, and they all died within two months of each other after, at the end of the contract. So that pretty much tells you what I think about 5G. Doesn't sound like a coincidence. And um, they were doing military grade, which was a little higher power than what your, our cell phones are, but still... If you've got a, I think if you've got a 5G cell phone next to you, you know, on your bed stand at night, it's going to be radiating that, that same radiation in the same frequencies. And over time, I think it's, uh, I think that there, you know, you're going to, you're going to suffer from it. Yeah. You know, I've started just keeping mine in the next room over just. I figure it won't hurt any, you know, and I don't yeah. know if it helps or not. Well, I still use an old, old phone that, without GPS and mm -hmm. everything else. I refuse to get one of the newer phones anyway. But uh, Smart man. Yeah. Um, I'm just, as you know, I'm kind of a private person. I only just decided to do this right now because... Uh, at my age, what the heck, you know? If they come after me for some reason or whatever, then so be it, you know? Right. And it seems like you've had a lot of, I mean, government contracts are the way to go. And I've, I've talked to other people that have worked with them. It's a great career. Um, what are your thoughts of some of these new kind of, they're not government, but they're somewhat private organizations like TTSA and stuff. What is up with those? Are they... Are they trying to do the right thing, or are they just information tubes? Well, well I, you know, they get funding from military or CIA or wherever they get their funding from, depending on, or DARPA, depending on what, what technology they're working on. Mm. And the way the government's done it ever since I was involved in the 70s and the way they started doing things, everything's com compartmentalized. And so all these little companies can work on one part of a certain technology and think that that's the, they're working on a technology that's they're developing or whatever. Um, mm. That's just a standalone technology when in fact it's a part of another system. Interesting. And, um, you know, and then they'll take it, what, these smaller companies develop and what they build and what they protect, they'll bring that all together and then that goes into a larger system. It's just like a like an F-22. You know, you've got avionics, you've got uh, all your flight controls, you've got all the different computers. A different company may build each each computer and each each different system within that within that. Uh, airframe mm -hmm. and thinking that they're doing it to develop robotics or something else but in fact, and then when they turn it over to the government the government will take it they might elaborate on it they might make some changes and incorporate it in, into a larger uh, larger platform genius so, genius yeah, so the people that are actually building all of these things and, and these smaller companies and that, you know, they, they think they're just working on a te standalone technology, but in fact, when it comes to the bigger picture, they're just working on a small component. 
it's going to be incorporated into a larger um, larger system. Su- um, such a great way to do things to not have people know what's going on. Yeah, it is. And except our education system suffers from it because if you watch, look at the education system the past 50, 60, 70, well, since World War II, um, education has been set up so that no one person can actually go in and get all the knowledge they need to know to do a particular technology. Mm. And, you're, and it takes me back to a, one of my favorite stories of all time, which was, I think was a release to let the public know what was going on in the government. And it was by a guy named Raymond F. Jones, who was a Mormon in Salt Lake City, and he wrote this, uh, he, he worked with the State Department. He was a uh, government, high-level government, and he wrote these stories on the side, and one of the stories he wrote was noise level. Mm. Noise level is a, uh, it's kind of a long story, but it's pretty interesting when you realize that it was written in 1952. And what it's about is the Pentagon, um, all the heads of the different departments in the Pentagon called a meeting with all of these scientists and engineers for all the different military contractors in the United States, called them to the Pentagon. When they uh, got to the Pentagon and they all sit around this big giant conference table and in the center of the table was a plastic wrapped bunch of burnt goo and and a big mess and a different thing. And one of the chiefs of staff stood up and he says, gentlemen, we have a problem. He says, "Uh, and I'm going to show you a video and it's going to be very difficult for you to believe that this is actually happening, but it's, uh, it's real and we need you to help us with this problem. And I have the aide go over, turn off the lights, they turn on a movie, movie projector, and there's a kid standing there with a pack on the, on the front, body pack on the back, and a button in his hand, and, and um, he's standing next to the chief of staff. And chief of staff nods to him, they're on an Air Force base. Kid pushes a button, and just something in his belly floats up 30 feet off the ground and just hovers. Then he flies around doing different maneuvers up and down and back and forth and and all of this stuff and then goes into a high speed race around the tarmac and then all of a sudden a big puff of smoke in the backpack, kid crashes to the ground and it kills him. Then they turn off the movie and the chief of staff tells the scientists and everybody that uh you know, gentlemen, this kid discovered anti-gravity. We don't know how he did it. We know nothing about this kid. But we need you, since he did it, you know, you should be able to do it too. And all scientists stood up and these professors from the university stood up and said, oh, the laws of physics says that's impossible. We can't do that. And to shorten the story, um, they gave him six the Pentagon gave these guys six months to come up with a solution to the problem. Jeez. And uh, so all these guys go back to Lockheed, North of Grumman, back to the universities and different places that they work and they keep collaborating and all of this and I'm gonna make it a short story, but um after six months time I'm leaving out a lot of details, but after six months' time, the general's calling back to the Pentagon, well, gentlemen, have you had any success? And one of the spokespersons for the engineers and everybody stood up and said, well, we have good news and bad news. He says, he said, well, what's the good news? Well, we cracked the code and we've developed anti-gravity. Well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is it's 30 feet in diameter and weighs 15 tons. 
but Whoa. it works. So the one of the generals stand up and he says, "Well, gentlemen, we have something to show you." And he goes over to a side door, opens the door up, and out comes the kid that was killed in the in the uh, film mm. that they'd watched six months earlier. Everybody gasped. They go, "Well, we saw him die." And well, gentlemen, that was all a Hollywood magic. We had the film made, and the only way we could convince you to go develop this new technology was to remove the noise placed in your brain by the education system and by the way you were educated and the way you grew up. And the only way we would ever take that out of your mind was to make you believe that it was possible to develop anti-gravity. Mm. Amazing. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. So, you know, it's like Albert Einstein quoted, you know, if you judge a fish's ability, judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll go through the rest of its life believing it's stupid. Because <laughs> he was putting down our education system, said that the education system really didn't educate people. It just conditioned them and indoctrinated them and into believing something different. So well, true. It's real. Mm -hmm. and I'm a firm believer of that having experienced it throughout my life because uh, working on some of the projects I've worked on and some of the technology I've developed for, well, I worked with casinos for 30 years for developing technology, you know, computer systems, different things like that. And you get these kids out of school, they want to argue with you, try to tell them, here's how we're going to do this system. And I, They'll argue with you all day long, but, oh, that's not right. That's not what I was taught in school. It's only because they they were taught that there's only one way to do things, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And anything outside of that is, uh, is not possible or it's wrong. It, it's hard to think out of the box. It is. And... Uh, well, if you think about it, most of the inventors throughout history, none of them were educated formally in the, in the, the traditional education system. You know? mm -hmm. Very there true. Free thinkers that had an idea or got it from from you know just thought it up or it was injected into them by an outside source. And they stuck with it, developed the technology, and well, like Nikola Tesla, for example. Mm -hmm. He was educated, but everything that he came up with, he always claimed that he got it from from uh, aliens or from other sources, you know. It just came to him while he was asleep. Mm -hmm. And um, the ideas that he came up with, and... Uh, we're getting hot on a tangent. It's so true, you though. Know? Yeah, they're free thinkers. They think outside the box. Yeah. So that's my take on all of that. But in getting back to 5G, I just think it's a really bad idea, and I think it's pre-planned the uh, same way COVID was. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, and I wish we had more time to talk about that one because now, I mean, gosh, now that it seems to be over... We got these Fauci emails, and the mask thing is weird. It's gosh, it's so weird. Well, not only that, it's 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 the uh, immunization, you know. Mm -hmm. I I equate it to 1930s Germany. If you know that history, the incurable illness, they couldn't tell you what the illness was. They could only say it was the incurable illness, and they locked down the entire country. They had. Everybody had to get tested. The whole thing behind it was is Hitler and all of the people in the Nazi party that was trying to convert Germany to the nationalist socialist country it became. They used that because they knew that there were professors, college professors, there were educators, there were journalists, there were other people that were... They, 
seem subversive and that wouldn't go along with the program that would be a problem. So they invented the incurable illness. And then a Dr. Brandt was ordered by Hitler to go to all of the do doctors and throughout Europe with a list of all of these people that were subversives and all that, and they came up with what was called, uh, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but what was called the uh, mercy death injection. So they would test all of these people. If you were on the list, you know, you immediately were, admitted, you know, put in the hospital. And to be cured or to investigate your illness, the incurable illness, and what they did to eliminate all of their competition or any, any problems that they would have in the future, they uh, administered a mercy death injection to all of these people. Hitler killed over three, mi three million people. Jeez. That way, long before the Jews. Mm -hmm. And that's a little piece of history that people really don't know about. Wow. What we see now, what I think, what my opinion is, what we see now is uh, adaptation of what Hitler did in 1930s Germany. It is scary times, and it. I just hope we sh we're seeing the end of it. Because, but then, like you said, if it, I guess only time will tell, my man. I I don't want to keep you much longer, Terrence. I appreciate you stay talking to you. I, gosh, it's been a better part of a year that I've wanted to talk to you, and I'm glad we're finally chatting again. We'll have to yeah. we'll, we'll have to meet up and and chat again when we're nearby. Yeah, we will have to meet up. And, you know, I still go to the basin quite often, so that'd be great. I should. Uh, I should uh, contact you next time I come over. That sounds great, my man. Well, take care, and um, I hope I talk to you soon. Yeah, same here. Man, I wish I could just keep picking Terrence's brain, because holy cow, does he have a lot of information. And they don't come any cooler than Terrence. He is a great guy, honest, and he's worked on a lot of interesting things. And uh, it's a pleasure every time I talk to him. Thanks for listening in and uh, definitely check out heroparanormal.com. Check out Hero Paranormal on Patreon and hit that Patreon if you want or hit uh, if you go to heroparanormal.com, just hit that donate button. You can cancel at any time. We appreciate it. And until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Hey. Off in my time machine, third eye feeling like an need visine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine, third eye feeling like an need visine. Blast off, blast off.